Hello everyone and I'm Joanna Penn from thecreatorofpen.com and I am here tonight on Facebook Live to answer any questions that you have on writing, self-publishing, book marketing or well anything you like really. I am here for oh, at least half an hour if you have any questions and uh, happy to answer anything. So um, I would love to start off by just seeing if anyone's around because uh, although so this is my second uh, live event it's a, a kind of a new thing for me and interesting to see if anyone's there so just uh, write uh, type you can type a comment uh, under the video which you should see on Facebook and uh, actually already have a question which I will answer straight away uh, the question is how do you actually do Facebook Live uh, because it's quite a new thing and people are only just uh, starting to do it. Well, not brand new, but um, oh, hi, Linda. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so in terms of actually doing Facebook Live, this is um, an iPhone. So you can, I think at the moment, only do it on mobile. And I've got it set up on a like a little tripod thing with a um, a stand and I've got the the mic for the quality of the audio so someone specifically asked the question um, why do you need the headset because there's no talking not like no one's talking to me um, that's true this is just for um, you getting good audio through the mic so um, hello Donna lovely to see you this evening so let's um, let's kick off if you have some questions I do have some uh, here ready so uh, but I wanted to see we'll have some some live Live questions as we as we go. Oh, I love seeing the little. You see the little hand go across the the, the page. That's really nice. Thank you. Little thumbs up. Uh, so, well, I'll start by going into uh, book launch this week um, because I think that people often uh, love to know what happens during a book launch. So, um, this week the successful author mindset uh, went live, and I guess. In the old days when I first started publishing, uh, the launch was a lot more of a big deal. And I think still people get obsessed with launches because of the traditional publishing model where the launch spike is so important. And of course, remember in traditional publishing, what happens is that they get, um, the author will get assigned a publicist, whatever, for the month of publication. And then often they will move on to the next lot of books in the next month. So for traditionally published authors, the launch is super, super important because they might not get any more attention for their book so but for indies it's super important to remember that our business model is a little different so remember if you own the rights to your book your intellectual property assets then you actually can make money with that book for the rest of your life and according to current copyright law between 50 and 70 years after you die so that's a pretty long time so if you think about your books in that way then the launch is not such a a big deal so um, and thank you Natalie says uh, halfway through the new book making notes as I go along as I bought the workbook thank you for that Natalie um, so that's very very cool but the point is with our books as indies is we want to be thinking of these longer term marketing things and longer term sales. So right now, for example, I'm um, making more money on a box set with the Arcane series and also the London Psychic series, which are a fiction box sets, um, which, of course, I could never have done when I only had one book. So when you have multiple books, you can do things that actually enable you to do better long term marketing. So just to kind of complete that, I, I can see some questions uh, coming in um, but basically to complete the launch I only did a few things for the launch of successful author mindset so of course first of all I have a platform I have you guys I have this Facebook page I have the blog I have the podcast and I pretty much told everyone about that I sent an email and of course classic technical hitch uh, some of the emails the links the hyperlinks didn't work there's always something that goes wrong on a launch um, but it wasn't it wasn't too many people so that was cool um, and then um, I did some so I did the email I did the um, did Facebook ads and we did a video some of you might have seen the wonderful video um, my husband Jonathan made which is very cool of the
the Successful Author Mindset, or it's on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, and also we did a static ad, and actually that static Facebook ad, if anyone saw it, um, I just literally picked the first um, blue background on canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com, and uh, that was really super useful. So, um, and those two ads on Facebook, and also I'm in the book bub beta ads and did some uh, of those but that wasn't too big a deal to be honest the the main thing is when you have a list um, that's what the best launch uh, sort of strategy is okay so uh, I can see lots of questions coming in so I'm gonna start um, answering those just scroll up to the top lovely to see everybody Alison says finishing up my holiday in London love I'm able to catch you online thanks Alison uh, evening everyone okay Linda says knowing what you know now what would you do differently in your habits if you were just starting as a full-time author oh this is a tough one but I actually think that this process of habits it's just an ongoing process because you and you know all of these things it's like a muscle you get better the more you do it so when when I first started out writing fiction for example I didn't have enough ideas like I had to my habit had to be to go out into the world and kind of get ideas now I get loads of ideas the habit is actually writing them down probably the biggest thing I think is to have a production plan and I know sometimes for artists the phrase production plan sounds a little bit technical, but all production plan is for me on the wall where I'm looking now, I've got a couple of boards with lots of stuff on and it says by 30th of June and actually I need to change it because it's now July. <laughs> But it has author mindset, it has um, the Kobo short story which I had to write, it has plot end of days, it has um, the walk that I'm doing because I'm training for this 100 kilometers in a couple of weeks um, and some other things, screenplay, and I did a screenplay but it's not very good. <laughs> so what I will now do is replace that bit of paper with what I'm doing over the next three months. So it's a kind of a 90 day plan and I kind of wish I'd have started that earlier because it keeps your mind focused on these bigger creative projects. I mean obviously things like you know setting up some ads or responding to email, you can't put those up on your bigger board you have to have something bigger to aim for so whether that's um, you know so you can have on your list 500 words a day or a thousand words a day but on your 90 day plan it should be like the working title of your book or something that will keep you engaged for that longer term otherwise you get to the end of the year and you wonder like what the hell you've been doing <laughs> okay uh paul says um uh see more May I ask you a podcast question? Yes, you may ask me anything in this uh, this time. Uh, I have a new podcast. I'm on episode 17. How far down the line were you before you started getting some traction? What helped you grow your audience the most? Okay, so podcasting. Uh, I started podcasting in 2009. So before it was kind of even called podcasting, it was just sort of audio downloads. Um, and it was um, a bit, bit different back then, really. And to be honest, I never considered it to be a channel as as it is now it's kind of like when people started blogging blogging was never meant to be commercial and then over time people started using it to sell things and then it drives people's business so the same with podcasting when I started it was not a commercial enterprise I literally started podcasting because I didn't have any friends who were authors I didn't know anyone who was an author I wasn't I didn't know anything about the business so I thought well if I start a podcast I can talk to people I can learn um, and people will spend time with me as opposed to me just pitching them all the time so it was me trying to offer a service to people in order to make friends in the business so I don't think it really counts um, how far it started you know me starting to get traction also remember that when I started my blog and podcast 2008-2009 self-publishing was a dirty word um, this was not a thing at all um, what's happened over the years is as it's become more popular and acceptable then I've got more traffic but the question what helped you grow your audience the most okay the biggest thing with all of this is networking with other people and I'm an introvert you guys know that if you hang out often enough on my podcast um, so doing this type of stuff is 
difficult, but um, every time you connect with somebody in person and you get them on your podcast, they are likely to share that with their audience. You'll get a backlink to your um, website to make sure you have a website page with the blog. You will get, um, they will likely to share it on social media. Um, they might, uh, you know, if you do a transcript, for example, and I use speechpad.com to do my transcripts um, and my wonderful VA Alexandra then formats it. If you do a um, the the transcript, you can then use that, tell them that they're welcome to use it. They might do a blog post. So basically the biggest thing that is going to help grow your audience is the podcast itself. So I would say you need at least six months of anything before you judge whether or not things are working. So I hope that helps. Okay. Currently listening to The Inevitable on audiobook, which is a fantastic book. I've got it on my desk right here um, by Kevin Kelly. It's a fantastic book about the next 30 years um, of technology. I'm actually working on a mega blog post about the future of publishing, which I want to, is going to go on my board for the next 90 days. Um, Lee says, what are your thoughts about just in time purchase of eBooks seems to take away the need for pre-sales? Um, yeah. Okay. So the reason I now do pre-sales is mainly, well, I do it for two reasons. On iBooks particularly, they really like it and you are actually more likely to get noticed and get more merchandising if you have a pre-order. So I've had end of days on pre-order since I put out um, Destroyer of Worlds. Uh, so having those longer pre-orders is really good. Kobo also the same, like to see the pre-orders and will look for potential promotions by seeing the pre-orders that are there. Uh, on Amazon, it is kind of pointless. Now, what I've been doing is setting up long pre-orders on uh, Kobo and iBooks and draft a digital because it takes a while to get through ripple through the system. The other reason to do it is just preparation. It means that on your go live day, on your launch day, you don't have to be loading files up and wondering whether things have got through. Um, actually, and many people did notice um, the print books for um, the successful author mindset were available about a week prior to the launch because I had done all those in advance. You can link them up to the pre-order. So on the day that I said, um, which was the 29th of June, the book is now live, it was there in ebook, it was there in print book, audiobook, already on the day. And the benefit of having pre orders is that you can make sure the page looks nice, you can make sure everything is all working beforehand, it just takes the stress off. So, I'm a definite oh, and the other good thing with pre orders, it will kick you in the ass. <laughs> oh, yes, I said ass again. Um, because you need to have a deadline, and if you've set up your pre order, it will help you with a deadline. So, yeah, those are some good reasons to do pre orders. Elaine says, how important do you think book trailers are and audiobooks as a stream? I do well with my two series, haven't done either of the above. Um, yeah, so book trailers, I don't believe are, I, well, so, so we did just did a book trailer for the Successful Author Mindset. Um, I've also done book trailers for several of my fiction. I don't think they sell loads of books. I think they are quite good for attention grabbing and they're quite good for brand building. So the Successful Author Mindset video is a nice brand builder. However, I don't believe that it should be done in um, on its own. I think that a book trailer is probably only useful if you have a YouTube channel um, and a blog and you incorporate it into your other marketing. So have like a campaign. And this, I think this is something I've learned recently with marketing is to to have more of a campaign angle on the whole thing. So to come at people from different angles. So those of you who bought the um, the book in whatever format, you will have heard about it in some form or another, perhaps multiple forms. And that's the point. You know, like I had some people saying, oh, I didn't know it was available. And then I just saw your video on YouTube or I didn't know it was available. I saw your tweet. So actually having a campaign approach to book marketing. Uh, and audiobooks. Okay, so audiobooks, this um, this audiobook I've just done this time, uh, I've done as a, as sort of I recorded it myself. So that is different to how I've done it before. Um, previously, I hope I'm back. <laughs> Well, this seems to happen with the Facebook Live thing. The internet goes um, in and out. But uh, anyway, so audiobooks, I was um, doing it um, through ACX and I probably will continue with ACX for my fiction, but for my non-fiction, I'm just recording it myself. 
Okay. Fantastic. Ricky says, I'm finding it difficult to write a list of keywords for my book. Um, finding it hard to put myself in anyone else's shoes. Any tips? Okay, so keywords, yeah, really hard. Um, for fiction, particularly hard. For fiction, you're thinking about, uh, you know, things like action, adventure, thriller series, I think is one that, keyword that I'm using. And keyword, remember, is keyword phrase as well. For nonfiction, like this author mindset, keyword was a nightmare because actually there aren't many books on the topic of this kind of psychology of writing. I actually think I used psychology of writing as a keyword. Um, so I used more generic things like, um, you know, authorship, which is actually a category, but I used it as well in the keyword. Um, so yeah, give it a go. And But remember, you can change it over time. So, um, but make sure you go into the amazon.com search bar, type stuff in, have a look. It's really a brainstorming exercise and no one can do it for you, unfortunately. Uh, Ruby says, uh, how is your BookBub beta ad going? Very well, Ruby, and um, hopefully BookBub. Uh, so BookBub, obviously you can submit your book to the daily email that BookBub send out. So that's, that's available to everyone. Anyone can submit to that. They have a beta program right now for paid ads along the lines of Facebook ads. And I'm finding box sets in particular are doing really well. You can also target much more granular author names because of course that's what BookBub does. So uh, I would recommend anyone try, you know, go to the BookBub ad uh, thing and request access um, if you're someone who is spending some money on advertising and I would say having multiple books in a series you will do better than just individual books. Okay so I don't have wine tonight I actually have tea. <laughs> right uh, it's peppermint tea, in case you were wondering. Uh, Imogen says, you just mentioned a website you used for the blue for your advert. Oh yes, um, so that was Canva, C-A-N-V-A dot com, Canva dot com. Amazing for doing images for any social media or advertising because they have loads, of, oh, even book covers. You can do book covers in Canva. It has different uh, dimensions, so it makes it very easy to do images. It is like the top tool and it's free. It's amazing. Oh, thanks, Cyril, shared uh, there. Um, Donna says, how do I market my book? <laughs> Donna, this is a big topic. <laughs> um, yeah, my, and she says, mine seems lost. This is a, you know, this is a big deal. The fact is that all of us are swimming around in this pond of lots of authors, but it doesn't matter whether you're an author or you're something else. Say you're an accountant for a small business. Um, you know, everyone is swimming around in a sea of lots of people. The thing is trying to work out how you stand out and then find a way to actually get noticed. And that will differ when you write fiction or nonfiction. For example, my nonfiction, as I just mentioned, I can put out a blog post, I can do a podcast because I've built up my author platform for nonfiction. For fiction, I'm using paid advertising like Facebook. I'm using, I've changed my perma-free recently. This is another little tip. Like some people think perma-free is just for getting uh, promotion, like as in free downloads, but also having a perma-free book, a good one, will get you more reviews. And once you've got more reviews on a book, um, you can then do interesting things with paid advertising. So right now I'm doing stuff on Stone of Fire, which was my first novel, and uh, it's got loads of reviews. So I'm sending traffic to that. Um, because you know it's now not perma free it's on 99p in the uk and it's been in the top 100 on amazon uk this weekend so um because i took it off perma free but i've made desecration perma free for a little bit so that's quite fun uh Patrick says, coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. It says, I'm launching my first fiction post-apocalyptic that we first in a series. Any ideas to promote first in a series? I'm not a proven name. So Patrick, definitely wait until you have a couple of books in the series. And then I would, going back to the perma-free, perma-free first book in series and using things like BookBub, um, you know, that type and free booksy. I just did a free booksy this weekend that, you know, you don't have to get a BookBub. There are lots of other services you can use to promote that free first in series 
and do a box set. So this is a really big deal. As soon as you have three books in a series, I would do a box set. And uh, remember on Kobo, on iBooks, on, and I actually have three book book set, three book box sets on Amazon, but I have an eight book box set on iBooks and a seven book on Kobo. And those sell for higher um, income. And uh, they, I, reckon this year they will make up a, a much bigger chunk of my income so and and this is something that you know traditional publishers are catching up with indies in terms of the paid advertising um but they are not taking advantage of the box sets uh, so much when you write uh, lulu says when you write your fiction novels do you stop reading other fiction work Absolutely not. I actually, when I want to write a certain type of book, I binge read that genre because I want to kind of steep myself in the language and uh, um, just to remind myself of what the readers of this genre want. So right now I'm coming up with ideas for a new um, series which will be set in the pagan southwest of England which is where I now live because I'm always very influenced by setting and so uh, we're going to be look you know going to some places in Wales and on the borders and looking at this sort of pagan side so I'm reading a lot of horror pagan horror set in Britain a lot of uh, covens and ancient burials and ancient evil a lot of James Herbert I love James Herbert <laughs> he's amazing so no I absolutely read the genre that I'm writing so that I can satisfy the readers of that genre. Um, yeah. Zornitsa Ivanova, what a lovely name. That's, that's just lovely. Um, what are your thoughts on starting one's own publishing company? Why would you want or not want to do that? Um, so my opinion on publishing companies I can only talk from my own experience. So I have a company, uh, I have a, a limited company and um, it is, it has one arm of it is publishing, but at the moment I'm not publishing anyone else's books. So I am an indie author I but and I professionally publish my own books, but nobody else's. Um, if you want to start a publishing company to publish other people's books, then I don't have um, any experience of doing that. I would say that I think all of us, me included, authors are needy people. So personally, I really wouldn't want to work with a whole load of authors because I am an author. I want to focus on my own writing. So I wouldn't be looking to do that for other people in a big way. Um, yeah, so I think you have to be very careful when you think about starting a publishing company. What do you really want to spend your life doing? And do you really want to spend your life helping other people create their work as opposed to creating your work. And Stephen Pressfield talks about this in The War of Art and Turning Pro, the shadow career, he calls it, um, where you end up doing something maybe in the service industry, like like helping people publish or, you know, maybe being an editor. You know, we love editors, love you editors. Um, but maybe the editor should write a book or the publishing company person should write a book. Maybe that's a, the creative urge. Uh, okay, so uh, there's some thoughts anyway. Okay. Henry! Hi, Henry! Uh, says, thanks to the inf inspiration you've provided, I've given up roughly half my job and launched my own publishing brand. I imagine this would be for self-publishing my own stuff. Oh, this is a publishing company question too. Um, other people have been asking whether I will publish their stuff. Have you ever been asked to do this? I might consider it, uh, but it wouldn't want to get out of hand. Well, this kind of plays in what, into what I just said. So I get asked several times a week to publish other people, but we all only have a certain amount of time in our lives, right? Um, what do you want to do with your life? You know, I don't want to spend my time hand-holding someone else through the book process. I want to help, which is why I'm doing this, why I have the blog, why I have the podcast, why I have courses and books. Um, but I, I, I don't do consulting anymore because it's very hard to help one-on-one -on -one without your whole kind of time being taken up. So if you're thinking about doing this, just consider, all right, what is the percentage of time I need to do this uh, you know, I need for my own stuff. And what is the percentage of time that I have for other people? Of course, we also need income. So if you are using your service model to earn money so that you can build your assets, then super duper. Uh, we all have to do um, a spike 
income that gives us time for the longer term income. And that might be a day job, it might be other things, you know, for example, I'm gonna do some speaking this summer locally, that will give me some nice spike income, uh, that type of thing. Okay, moving on. Katerina says, my book is nearly finished, but I struggle to find an interior book uh, ebook designer. I'm reluctant to send the manuscript to a person I don't know. Okay, so on thecreativepen.com, so go to thecreativepen.com forward slash book cover design, and that, that has book cover designers, obviously. Some of them also do interior designers, or thecreativepen.com forward slash formatting, that also has um, some interior designers as well. Um, don't worry about sending your manuscript to someone you don't know. It is their job, and uh, you know, once you've actually done it, you'll stop worrying. But, um, you know, there, there will probably be a contract. You know, it, don't worry about that. It's really not, not a big deal. Santanam says, I'm watching you because I'm just scripting a story for a movie in India here in the US. Fantastic. Um, I'm very excited. Like, I really want Destroyer of Worlds to be a movie in India. That would just be amazing. So, um, fingers crossed for that. Oh, Natalie says, where did you buy that mug, Joanna? So... That's a really great question. And we're going to... Oh, no, the, everything reverses. You can't see that. It's reversed. It says, um, more than they say I can. And I got this mug as part of a Kickstarter with Seth Godin. Um, so Seth did a Kickstarter for a massive hardback book of his blog posts. Um, and with um, the pack I bought on Kickstarter included this handmade mug, um, limited, uh, limited distribution. So this is a Kickstarter benefit from Seth, who um, I've supported, well, not support, well, yeah, I have supported a lot of his stuff, as in I join his Kickstarters, I buy his books and courses. He's one of my online mentors. I've, I have met him, I've been to his live events, um, but, you know, he's just one of those people I just love to learn from. So I, yeah, love getting involved in what he does. So that's cool. Okay, question about Scrivener. Uh, I made my partner a convert. He's now writing too. We're talking about co-writing fiction. What is the best approach to organise co-writing with Scrivener? Okay, so co-writing with Scrivener is quite difficult because um, you can use Dropbox to sync it between your um, computers. It's best if you have you both have Macs or you both have PCs. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of it's not the best software for co-writing. Um, what I did with Jay Thorne, who I, um, and we've got a book, co-writing a book. Um, what we did was we both wrote separately. So I wrote in Scrivener, but then I copied and pasted what I'd written for that day into Google Docs. Um, but if your partner, if you're physically in the same place, then it probably won't be an issue. But I've never met Jay and he's in America and I'm in England. So basically we just used Google Docs and um, the that and each time we wrote we just added another file in and then once we'd finished the draft I took all of those files and put them into Scrivener and then we did the editing that way so um, also the the guys from SPP the self-publishing podcast uh, are coming out with story shop later this year which uh, you know one of the aims of the story shops software will be to have a better co-writing model Donna says, spell that please, perma what? Um, yeah, so perma free, I think that is what we're referring to. Perma free is when you have a book that is not just free for five days. So if you do KDP select, you can um, have your book on free for five days. If you um, make it free on Kobo, iBooks, draft to digital Smashwords, and then go onto Amazon and report a lower price, as in free, Amazon will price match to free, and your book can be perma free, as in free for a lot longer. So so Stone of Fire, for example, has been perma-free for about three and a half years, and this is the first time I've taken it off perma-free. Desecration has gone on to perma-free and will probably be there for a couple of months because I want to get more reviews on it. Oh my goodness, I'm going to try and read your name. Juan Antonio Guerrero Canongo. I, I've totally got that wrong, but thank you, Juan. Um, I just read one of your books and loved it. Um, I keep reading your books. I'm author of 34 books. Wow, that's amazing. They've gone well, but I want to do better. Well, if you have 34 books, like if you have that, mu that many assets, then my biggest tip would be to look at making them 
um, bundles and box sets and I'm actually going to do a, a blog post on box sets because I think people are still confused like I see people having a go at box sets but there are different ways to use them but when you have 34 different books hopefully some of them relate enough that you could bundle them together and use those to actually get more sales and more traffic um, into into your author name around also I'd be thinking about um, multiple platforms um, multiple countries that type of thing so that's very exciting I mean I'm that's what I'm aiming for well I'm aiming for what am I aiming for 100 books by 50 and I'm 41 so <laughs> I've got 18 books so I have to work a bit harder uh, okay uh, Lulu says how long on average does it take you to write a full-length novel from idea to published totally depends the, the length of time it takes to write a novel will depend on whether it is a new world or an established series. So, for example, my Arcane books, uh, it took me a month to write Destroyer of Worlds and then another month to edit it. So, two months. But this pagan series, I've been thinking about this for six months probably um, it will take me quite a long time to write that first one because of the new world desecration the first in the london psychic series took around 14 months so uh but then the other two were quicker so if you're creating a new world it takes a lot longer once you've got an established world uh it's quicker Oh, Henry says, um, thanks. I think I'm always too keen to be helpful to other people. Maybe if I can afford an assistant, they could handle publishing other people's stuff. Do you know, Henry, this is the thing, and it's very, in the mindset book, I included a quote from Austin Cleon, who wrote uh, Steal Like an Artist and some other books. <laughs> Great guy, Austin Cleon. And uh, the quote I used was something like, um, be as generous as you can, but don't let it impact your own creative work. So that's kind of my motto as well. It's, you know, help as much many people as you can, but make sure that you don't stop creating your own work. Because, uh, you know, we all love helping, but people will, rem like getting that successful mindset book done was more important and I can help more people with that book than I can by doing one-on-one -on -one consulting. So I think it's very important to try and balance this stuff. Jack says, what are your thoughts on promoting your book in book fairs? Um, okay, so book fairs like London Book Fair, Frankfurt Book Fair, there will be um, emails that come around from these services offering places at book fairs. I've been to a lot of book fairs now. I do not think you should bother ever buying a slot at a book fair. I just don't think that sells books. Agents and publishers are not at book fairs to um, get direct input from an author. Um, go to book fairs and go to the training tracks. So go to the seminars, learn about that type of stuff. Really great to go to a book fair and learn about the industry. But I wouldn't um, do book, you know, I wouldn't take my books to promote them. If you mean a more local book fair, so for example, there are lots of people, you know, I went to recently one um, locally here. Um, it was, I guess, a literary festival, stroke book fair, lots of authors, you know, readings, sessions, talks. Um, that can be very good for selling, hand selling some books. And I know some uh, writers who go to the big conventions like Comic-Con, so genre conventions can be good. Um, but yeah, I think, there are many ways to sell books. Um, not great for introverts, live events. Um, do you know of any successful authors who write using dictation and are pantsers? Um, I want to say Elle Casey. I'm not 100% sure she's a pantser, but I did a, a podcast with her earlier this year. Um, and she she goes for a walk you know, with her dog and just talks. So I'm pretty sure she at least pants some of it. Uh, we'll see. Okay, Isaiah Green says, I love using Google Docs. I write at home, work, on the train to work. Fantastic. Dylan says, what location venue have, seen, have you seen to be the most beneficial, i.e. bookstore, Comic-Con, book fair? Okay, Dylan, the best venue location is online. <laughs> That's it. For selling books, you, will, you need to be on the bookstores. So Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Nook, 
you know, use Drafter Digital, your own website if you have traffic. So I'm now selling direct as well. And I expect that to probably match audiobook income from ACX, maybe even my print income by selling direct, but that I do have traffic. So um, we'll see. But definitely for me, um, you know, my books are mainly sold online in 74 different countries. So online is going to always be the best. I mean, look what's happening right now. Um, you know, we've got a number of people live which is really awesome and the last it's crazy uh, just to encourage you guys about doing facebook video if you're at all interested in this and this is very hard for me just so you know i'm like beforehand i'm psyching myself up but you know but it's amazing the last video last week went out to over three hundred thousand people <laughs> that's just crazy so it said the reach was three hundred thousand people that's mental so if you're thinking about doing video now's a really good time because Facebook's really promoting video. So um, I would say any type of online marketing, this is going out to lots of countries, the recording will go on YouTube and the blog and all of that. So doing online stuff will always be the most bang for your buck in terms of marketing. Doris says, when offering both a paperback and ebook version, do you recommend removing the pictures in the ebook version? Yeah, I do actually, um, and even the print version. My general comment around images in books is, do they really need to be there? And could you instead put a download page on your website that that A, gets people to your website and maybe get them to sign up for something so you get their email, which is critical. Um, and also it will um, make your print books less expensive and your eBooks will also have less um, delivery costs. So yes, I definitely think you should try and keep uh, images out of your books if possible. However, in my book career change, I have images and like in my fiction, I have images at the beginning of every chapter, but very small ones. So you have to decide what you want and what will make your book look nice. But my ebooks don't have any images in my fiction ones, anyway. Uh, okay, so how are we doing? Are we doing good? What's the time? 8.36. I was only going to do half an hour, but now you're all here, then I'll just carry on. <gasps> Oh, Ashling says, wow, on the Facebook video. Yeah, seriously, wow. So um, please do this. Bettina says, you make it look very easy. <laughs> I'd be terrified. I am terrified, Bettina. Thank you for all being so supportive um, of doing this. And I like I really the, the only reason I'm doing it again is because last week it was people said it was really useful. So I want to be useful. And why not do it on a Sunday night in uh, in England? Okay, Natalie says, um, how can you get Amazon to bundle parts of a series into one product? I have a series page, um, but then I want to sell it as a set. Okay, so um, when I'm talking about box sets, it's when you create a new product which contains multiple books. And I will put a blog post up about this this week. Um, because I think it's confusing to people. But if you look at my Arcane series on Amazon, they are a series and the price is per series, but it's not a box set. So if you look at the box set I have on Kobo, it's priced as one file. You just get one file. So basically you don't do bundles using Amazon. You upload a new file and you give it a new name, which is box set or bundle or whatever. That is a new product. Um, so, and you can sell the series on its own and as box set. So at the moment, Arcane series, um, take uh, Kobo, for example, on Kobo, it's eight separate books, a seven book box set and two, three book box sets. You can really buy it in multiple ways. <laughs> uh... Oh, Juan well, Antonio is in um, Mexico. It says I write about Mexico. That's fantastic. Mexico is on my list. I want to come to Day of the Dead. Um, Paula says I have your book on the business of writing. Thank you very much. I hope it's useful. Um, does it? Uh, okay. I've started my own business because I write poetry and Christian paperbacks. Um, I have a master's in children's literature. I'm taking it seriously. Does it sound like I'm on the right track to have my own publishing company? Okay. Got to be clear on this. Poetry will not make you money. Poetry is done for the love of it um, and is wonderful but is not the basis of a business. Children's literature right now is growing, but again, you will always sell fewer books um, with children's um, books. So but mainly because eBooks haven't really gone mainstream and the volume is much smaller. Uh, so 
but Christian paperbacks, if they are either Christian self-help, non-fiction, or are Christian fantasy, Christian fiction, that is a really good market. And I've actually got a um, interview with Jeremy uh, Baumar on my site, which we talk about Christian publishing. So go check that out. Um, what is your recommended word count for a non-fiction book? Uh, my first book is about being a dad at 40 and based on my blog, uh, fantastic. Well, one, fantastic. If you have a blog already on being a dad at 40, having a book is a great idea and definitely self-published if you have a, a platform, unless you get a really big uh, deal offer, which you could because being a dad at 40 is quite, is one of those, you know, zeitgeisty topics. Um, but I would say for nonfiction, okay, so my smaller books are around 27 to 40. So the successful author blueprint is about 30, uh, the successful author mindset is around 35,000, I think. So it's quite small, whereas how to market a book is 70,000. So most, um, you know, most nonfiction will be between 30 and 70, somewhere in there. Uh, what made you decide to sell your books on your website in dollars instead of pounds? I'm UK and would have sold in pounds. Okay, this and um, for the for you Americans listening, this is not meant to be offensive, okay? <laughs> but actually, Americans are resistant to buying in a currency that is not their own. And the truth of it is the biggest market for online purchasing is Americans. So one, you want to really get Americans and also they are Americans are happier buying online than other nationalities because they've been doing it longer. So this will change over time. But basically, you, people in the UK and Europe and all over the world are, are very used to buying in US dollars. So they won't bulk at buying in US dollars, whereas an American might bulk at buying in in pounds because they don't know the exchange rate for example so not meant to be offensive to anyone but in terms of making the most money even if you are not in the US I think pricing in US dollars is the best way okay oh hey Derek Derek says come to Mexico next spring I'll rent a palace by the sea <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome uh, I thought you were getting a castle in Europe Derek <laughs> okay uh, Lulu says, would you mind sharing your experience before you published Stone of Fire? Did you share them with other writers, um, writing groups, etc.? Basically with Stone of Fire, I did, was part of a writing group, well, a writing course. It was how to write a novel in a year. And uh, I shared, so I shared some of those chapters with the teacher, but then I just paid for editors. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I am very focused on doing this as a career. I want to learn as fast as possible and I would rather pay for expert advice, save up and pay for expert advice than take advice from unpublished writers. Again, that might offend some people, but um, I'm much more of a believer in paying for editorial comments. So I paid for two structural edits and two full end-to-end -end edits on that first book. Uh, and then I think I had another edit later on. Uh, but yes, there we go. Thomas says, uh, my introvert alarms are being red alert going live like this. You're doing amazing. Okay, so the main thing is about doing this type of stuff is I am actually on my own in my study. <laughs> so I guess for, for an introvert, this is much easier than like going down the pub and having a chat. You know, I am just here in my study with you guys. Um, okay. Uh, Linda says, how do you get so much done? <laughs> And, you know, I've had a few comments recently about the getting stuff done. And I do think, you know, I, I do work pretty hard, <laughs> but I love it. I love what I do. And, uh, you know, I, I usually I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing than working on the, la the next book, working on talking to you guys, you know, um, like today, I, you know, well, we did, did just what, binge watch the latest Game of Thrones series, which was awesome. I so love Game of Thrones. Um, so I did take some time off this week to literally watch whatever it was, 15 hours of television. <laughs> but no, it was super duper. Uh, okay, what else? Are we going to see your husband? <laughs> Do you know, I asked him, do you want to just pop in and say hi? And he's like, no, it's not really my thing. So he's going to remain like the shadow, the shadow husband in the background. Um, but he's not a phantom. He really does exist. <laughs> um, okay. 
When writing books that aren't part of a series, for example literary fiction, does the perma-free strategy work? Is there a better way to market books from one author that aren't in a series? Great question, Lee, and um, this is something I've you know, I've talked to a lot of people about. I think if you write all standalone books, having a theme can be the way to make them seem a bit like a series. So even though they're not a series, if the covers have a resonant design, so like make sure the font and your author name is always the same, um, you know, if they are, if there's a common theme, like for example, uh, a landscape, maybe they're, maybe they have a strong sense of place or something like that. Try and use that to link them together. So at the end of the book, this one standalone, and you want to link it to another standalone. Say, if you enjoyed this story of a strong female heroine in Scotland, maybe you'll enjoy the the tale of the strong female heroine in Croatia uh, next time or whatever the link is around or if you've enjoyed this story of loss which a lot of literary fiction for example will be about loss um you know try this book next so try and think of ways to link the individual books also a box set um I think can work for standalones um that have some linking element okay 15 more minutes uh uh, so any questions you have? Um, oh, Natalie says, uh, Phantom of the Opera music after the Phantom Husband. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice for adapting a plot line or story idea of your own and totally changing the setting or some of the characters? Um, so I'm not quite sure if you mean taking the plot line of a... Of a um, you know, someone else's, like a movie or something, and then changing the setting and the characters. Like, people do do that. And I think the thing to remember there is nothing we write is truly original. And we're always taking ideas from the milieu of the world, great artists steal and all that. Um, but there is a line between ideas and plagiarism where you have to be very, very careful. So I would say, you know, if you, you know, I like Dan Brown, but if I suddenly started you know, writing a book about a Da Vinci code <laughs> and changing the name of it and made it the Michelangelo code or something, I would feel a little bit awkward about that. So, uh, yeah. Um, oh, it looks like we've run out of questions. Oh, there we go. Okay. Are there any more questions this evening before um, I head off? We have done 45 minutes. So um, that's kind of crazy. Um, you know, it's really good to be on here, but um, I'll just wait uh, another minute or so. Oh, there we go. The questions are now coming in. <laughs> so yes, last, last few um, minutes. So yeah, get your questions in. Um, Lee says, uh, I'm going to have to draw up a long term strategy for my writing now. This is a really good point and something that I always think about. And around this time of year, so we're at the beginning of July, halfway through the year, it's a really good time to step back and go, OK, what did I say I was going to do this year? And what do I need to do in the next six months in order to achieve that? So that long term strategy idea, and that's what I very much cover in my Creative Freedom course, is that whole idea of the bigger deal around um, having a, a business for the long term. This long term strategy, I really urge everyone to step away from the minutiae of, you know, line edits and advertising and how many reviews you have. Step away from that and think, what do I want to do for the next 10 years of my life or five years or whatever? Um, and then think, like I've got on my wall here, what can I create today that impacts my long term legacy? So uh, that's really important. I hope that this does in some way because I like, I really love hearing from people who say that I've helped them on the author journey somehow and got more books into the world. So that is one of my, one of my goals. Paula says, what do I think about a book of children's poetry or picture books? Okay, children's poetry, like, and I'm immediately thinking of like Winnie the Pooh, uh, be seriously hard to break into as an indie. Um, and then for children's picture books, very hard print wise because they're very expensive um, but have a look at KDP Kids I think it's just 
KDP Kids ebook creator or something like that as a separate KDP for children's books. They're really trying to push the Kindle Fire for kids. Um, so I would have a look at that and ebook picture books. Um, but of course, they're expensive with illustration unless you're an illustrator. I'd also recommend people check out Karen Inglis. Um, Karen and then I-N-G-L-I-S. Karen has loads of stuff for children's authors. Um, she's fantastic. Kristen said, oh, look, everyone's put loads more questions on now. I'll never get, I'll never get out of here. Um, we will finish at the top of the hour, so 10 more minutes. Uh, Kristen, how are you finding working on screenwriting after working on novels? <laughs> Do you know, Kristen, it's really funny because I was like, yeah, I'm loving screenwriting. It's amazing. It's so much fun. And then I went to the screenwriting editing weekend and just went, oh my goodness, this is just a pile of crap, basically. Um, so writing screenwriting is just as hard as writing a novel and you have to learn all these different things. So I'm, it's kind of an ongoing project for me, the screenwriting stuff. But like I have on my desk here, Screenwriting Tricks for Authors by Alexandra Sokolov um, and Alex is an amazing author but she's also was a screenwriter so I think we can all learn a lot about writing novels and even narrative non-fiction from screenwriting tips because it's all hardcore story it really is good story structure what am I doing next week <laughs> I'm actually stuck so I've now finished the Successful Author Mindset. I'm, I'm going to be working on how to write a novel as a course. So I'm doing a, a course on how to write a novel, which will also be a book and an audio book, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm also starting to plan this Pagan series and also End of Days, Arcane Book 9. So lots going on. Uh, and also I'm doing my final training walks for the 100 kilometer. So I'm doing this 100 kilometer thing in not this not next weekend the following weekend the 16th 17th of july i will be doing 100 kilometers 50 on saturday 50 on the sunday so i'm walking a lot and listening to a lot of audiobooks oh my big recommendation for an audiobook is sapiens uh by i think it's yuval noah harari something like that absolutely amazing book um very, i couldn't read it because it but the audiobook was fantastic very dense but fantastic book um okay lulu says i'm planning on taking the masterclass with aaron sorkin yes i have also booked on that masterclass uh if people don't know what we're talking about go to masterclass.com and um i've done the james patterson one it's brilliant and this one with aaron sorkin on uh, screenwriting i think so cool uh do you have any suggestions for books on improving dialogue okay so uh, james scott bell has a book on dialogue which is fantastic i also did a uh, interview with him on the podcast also um robert mckee whose book story is kind of very important for everyone to read or listen to an audiobook um he's coming out with a book on dialogue which i think is is edited by sean Coyne, who wrote the story grid so um that's coming soon okay countdown lisa says for a mystery series, do I need to commit to self-publishing versus traditional publishing because most traditional publishers won't consider book two, three and four if one was self-published? Um, well, some publishers will. What, what they will want is to buy the whole thing or they'll want something new from you. So uh, my agent often says, um, uh, you know, if you have an idea for something new, that's what we'll pitch, not the existing series. Although Amazon Publishing in particular pick up existing series they might you know i've heard of them picking up like an eight book series that type of thing so it depends what you want but personally if you have a series with four books in you are at the point where you you should be making decent money so you might want to keep it henry says what's your favorite writing advice book it really depends where people are in the in the author journey um so if people are right at the beginning and they just don't have a clue i'll often recommend bird by bird by anne lamott because that really helps you get over the and this is a quote shitty first draft um that changed my life the concept that i didn't have to write perfection that so that that book stephen king's on writing always recommend that and now sean coins the story grids if people are very serious about doing this professionally 
Is it okay to plan a lot of books in advance? I get a new idea for a book every other day. Okay, on ideas, I think this is very important because ideas can also be a real issue. <laughs> and I know exactly how you feel. The most important thing is to just write them down because most ideas you get will not be a, f a book. They will be something that might go in a book. Um, but to have a you know, to have a really massive idea. Um, so I talked to Blake Crouch about this when I was at Thriller Fest last year um, about Wayward Pines. And if you haven't read the Wayward Pines trilogy, it's excellent, excellent. And he had that idea, like the big idea, and that's what t kind of moved him into the big leagues and it became a TV series and, and, and he got a very big publishing deal off the back of it after 10 years of indie, I think. And that was his goal, was to get into television. But that big idea, to, you know, that kind of life-changing idea might only come around a couple of times in a, you know, whereas lots of little ideas that we get every day. Um, I use Things app on my phone or I write things down in a journal. So just keep keep those ideas uh, logged somewhere so that you can go back to them later. Uh, Bettina, do I use Smashwords or draft to digital um, I use draft to digital mainly because they have a very easy to use platform and they pay monthly. So those are my two reasons. Um, although I've been friends with Mark Coker a long time. He was one of the first people I met in self-publishing and I think he's awesome. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much. Really enjoyed this. Uh, Scott says, apart, aside from matching one's book covers to top sellers, do you consider research on consumer psychology such as colour blue, larger author name? This, I, I generally do it based on looking at other authors in the genre. So, um, for example, my name is pretty big on my books because I want to be a brand name author. So if you want your name to be a brand, and this comes to genre um, as well, if you want author, um, readers to go, oh, the latest JF Penn is out, I want that, um, then your name should be big. Um, and yeah, I, th I think colour is important. For example, I would never use pink <laughs> on my covers because I write darker books. If you put pink on a cover, it's probably going to be romance in some way. So, um, but I do think larger author name is really important if you want to, you know, build that author brand over time. If you are like, for example, Lee Child, um, Lee Child's Jack Reacher books, there are now 20 books with the 21st coming. I couldn't tell you the name of any of those books. Oh no, I could. Kill Shot would be one of them. Um, but basically I've read almost all of them and I don't remember the book title. I remember Lee Child, Jack Reacher. So that's what we want. We want people to go, oh, you know, James Patterson, Stephen King, you know, it, it's the name that's important over time. Um... Kristen says, my connection's going, oh, back, I'm back, I'm back. Okay, right, we are counting down. Um, Zornitsa says, um, oh, wait. Last week you, Hayley says, last week you discussed hiring experts to advise on cultural elements. Where do you find these people? Okay, these are my beta readers and they actually come from my audience. So this is really important. So once you build a list, you can ask your list things. So I basically, I talked about writing Destroyer of Worlds and um, a, lady, a reader from India emailed me and said, I would love to read your book. And I emailed her back and said, I would love you to read it before publication and tell me what I've got wrong. Same happened with the volcanologist, um, the Maori guy, all from my list. So once you build up um, an audience, you can actually ask them. So I didn't hire them as such, they weren't paid. Um, they were just thanked in the acknowledgements. Do you think an author should stick to one genre? If you can, <laughs> I think it's really hard. Um, I think many of us love multiple genres. So do what you love, um, but you will get better traction if you write within a genre at first. Like if you write one romance, one horror, one non-fiction, you know, one children's book, you will not get as far as if you wrote four romance before you then moved into the other genres. Okay, so I think I'm going to end here. Um, oh, wait, wait, I'm going to... One more question. Lorna says, how do you say stay so positive when it feels like nothing is working? And Lorna, you know, I feel for you, it's, it's hard. And the thing is about this, me doing this live thing and me doing a podcast, I only ever share with you guys 
my up <laughs> time. Uh, so I'm actually really tired today. I was at my dad's um, art exhibition last night it was quite late there were a few wines um i've spent quite a lot of today in bed and then i'm like oh i just don't feel like this but i want to bring you some energy so how do you keep going how do you stay positive you think about that long term you think about all you know if if it's, if it's all gone wrong today go to bed do it tomorrow but keep focusing on that long term um you know listen to a lot of audio i listen to so much audio to kind of keep my energy up keep my future positive stuff going i read a lot of books um i think it's it's that kind of surrounding yourself with positive energy and i hope i do that for you guys on the podcast and now doing this um so yeah i hope that I can be some of that positive energy for you, but on days when it's just not happening, I don't share that with you generally. And that's why the successful or the mindset was so difficult because I share some down times in that book, um, which makes it pretty honest, um, but I hope it is helpful. Okay, right, I'm gonna say goodbye. So um, I probably, uh, I will do this again in a couple of weeks. It will probably be um, three weeks time after my 100K. <laughs> So um, I will let you all know when that is. It'll be towards the end of July. But I really enjoyed um, talking to you again. And thank you all for turning up. And um, I will be back soon. The podcast will be out tomorrow. So happy writing week ahead. Ha happy 4th of July, Americans. And uh, yeah, okay. Saying goodnight. <laughs>